I think most of us in academia, when we start a new project, we hope that it opens up questions for the people in our field, for the specialists in our field. But in some ways, it means very little if it doesn't also answer questions and tap into the curiosity of the greater public. So I really appreciate your presence here today um, and listening to what is basically a test drive of a book that I'm finishing and, and revising right now. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, all right. I'm going to read from a paper for about a page and then go off script. Um, OK. It became a commonplace by the end of April 1927 to apply to the flood then occurring in the Mississippi Valley phrases such as the greatest disaster that ever afflicted our country and the greatest tragedy in America's history. In loss of life, this flood was certainly not the worst the country had known. The Johnstown flood of 1889 and the Galveston, Texas storm surge of 1900 were both much more deadly. The reason the 1927 flood stood out and continues to stand out from other American disasters was because, the was because of the region-wide breadth of the flooding, hence the scale of its damages to sugar and cotton country, and its displacement of mass populations. Moreover, unlike these earlier catastrophes which occurred in, the matter of, in a matter of hours, this flood moved so slowly and lasted so long that global audiences could be pulled in through newly established media circuits to the events as they occurred. Indeed, almost real-time virtual disaster consumption began with the flood of 1927. And because no FEMA existed then, rescue and relief efforts amidst the unfolding events needed to be paid for by the public. This meant that the level of involvement of all branches of the media and entertainment industries, from radio to newspapers to vaudeville, could encourage, could encourage would have real outcomes in the lower Mississippi Valley. So media coverage was not just parasitic on, but rather integral to the well-being of Delta residents. So looking at this extensive coverage, uh, it shows us that the 1927 flood, more than any other until the New Orleans levee disaster of 2005, seemed not only an inevitable product of US history, but also its reenactment, its kind of uncanny reenactment played out as a stage show with a long enough run to allow fully national and even international participation in the drama. How the nation felt about the South, how it regarded the African American rural laborer, and how it managed its nature were all simultaneously on view. Most insistently to be seen was that two vast and interconnected systems, the racialized labor system of the plantation South and the environmental management system of the Mississippi watershed had profound design problems. Given that global populations in our own time have become chronically and unevenly pulled together through disaster experience and disaster spectatorship, it seems worthwhile to use the archives of the 1927 flood to help us think through how humans make meaning and sometimes even knowledge out of such mediated events. All right, so now to our story. So this is a map of the Mississippi watershed. Um, and what I want to big, I'm about to show you what occurred in the Mississippi watershed and changes to it in about the 75 years leading up to the flood. Um, and th the Mississippi River system is by nature flood prone. Uh, it's natural for there to be floods, sporadic disturbance events we know as floods. In fact, the, the health of the delta, the wealth of the soil in the delta is very much due to these disturbance events, these floods. Um, but what I want to show you in the next few slides is that this disaster, which occurred in 1927, was not natural. It was very much a man-made disaster. So why was that? Um, first is deforestation that occurred throughout the upper reaches uh, of the Mississippi watershed. And I'm going to actually go back to this slide and show you that um, 
Beginning in uh, the early part of the 19th century, you have extensive and industrial logging, beginning in Pennsylvania and New York. Uh, in the mid 19th century, it moved up to uh, the Great Lakes region, and then uh, after the Civil War, really in the 1880s, it moved down to the south. Um, and this logging was not uh, piecemeal or, or, or careful. It was carried on, as you can see from this image, from Duluth, Minnesota, at, a, at an industrial scale. Southern governments, which were quite impoverished after the Civil War, were quick to sell their land to logging interests, and they sold it at very uh, reduced prices and really didn't protect their natural resources very well at all. Um, and forest historians have talked about the South's really almost colonial dependency on uh, northern um, logging interests in this period. The second, uh, well, this, this, these maps show you nicely uh, that from, uh, excuse me, sorry, 1620 to 1850 to 1920, it shows you what happened to the old growth forests in the United, what became the United States, um, but also in particular uh, in the area that was the Mississippi watershed, how these forests gradually uh, the old growth forests, at any rate, gradually disappeared. Now you'll see that right in the middle of the country, this isn't a forested region. These are uh, grasslands, uh, tall grass prairie and short grass prairie. And while the deforestation was occurring, um, a similar process of uh, mowing under, essentially, or plowing under the tall and the short grass prairies occurred, at, again, at this kind of industrial scale. Um, now, one of the things that the roots of grasses and the roots of trees are very good at is holding water in. Um, and so what, what nature had done, essentially, before this industrial development was uh, in the upper reaches of the Mississippi watershed, when there was a lot of uh, um, uh, extreme uh, snow and rain and just winter runoff, was hold and store that water very well. Another landscape feature that, that held water were wetlands um, and uh, swamps and also very boggy land. And another industrial development that was going on at the same time as the deforestation and the plowing under was essentially a kind of drainage program um, of, uh, of many parts of the watershed. So another natural means of holding water was taken away uh, from the watershed system. So as the, I'll just go forward one slide for a second, as the ability to hold water was being kind of stripped from this parts, these parts of the watershed, um, planners beginning in the middle of the 19th century decided the way to manage the water that would increasingly go down uh, the lower Mississippi River was to have what was called a levees only policy. So that means essentially straighten the Mississippi River and uh, create walls around it and kind of turn it into a, basically a drain. Um, so it could drain all the water off of the center of the continent. And the idea was is that if, if you had a levees only system, it would turn the river into a very efficient kind of pipe, essentially. Um, and the thought was that the river would dig um, its bed out even deeper. Um, and so you could just evacuate this water very efficiently. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. Um, as silt came down from the upper um, stretches of the watershed, um, the level of the river became higher and higher. And so then you had to have levees built higher and higher. So that by the time of the Mississippi flood of 1927, you essentially have a river running above the land. And the levees were four stories high. Um, so that you can imagine in, in, an, in the 16th century, when the Mississippi flooded, it was a very gradual kind of seeping and spreading but that when you encase a river in a four-story high um, wall, when the wall breaks, it turns natural flooding into catastrophic flooding. Um, so this was the image of just of the levees being built uh, in 1890, you see. So this was the state of things in 1926 and why um, this environmental disaster was in many ways humanly made. Um, the other thing about the event in 1927 was that it was a social disaster. Um, and I don't think any of you here need to have me explain uh, the political conditions of the Jim Crow South. 
But I just want to emphasize that a, a kind of a part of Jim Crow that doesn't get talked about very much is the environmental vulnerability, particularly of, of poor sharecroppers, the majority of whom were African American. Um, and Jim Crow made them environmentally vulnerable uh, in a few ways. One was that uh, African American neighborhoods uh, and living quarters were typically on lower ground, so more susceptible during times of flooding. Um, the second was that, that work in times of flood, like the, the adding of sandbags to levees, was uh, almost exclusively carried about by African American men. Um, the third was uh, that because the majority of um, farm laborers in the Delta worked on the sharecropping system, it meant that uh, farm laborers were indebted to the planters and to their landlords throughout the cycle of the crop. So they could not leave the land lest they be arrested essentially for um, fleeing their debts. So what, what happened was a situation we call peonage, where, where these laborers were essentially land slaves. They, they could not leave their land. Um, so this was the situation leading up to 1926. Now, this, this is a map of the Mississippi River uh, south of Cairo. Here's the juncture uh, of the Ohio and the Mississippi River. And these are events I want to describe um, beginning, uh, well, actually, I'm sorry. Let me go back one slide uh, and, and take you to the fall and the winter, the fall of 1926 and, and the winter of 1927 uh, before flooding went, went south of Cairo. Um, so there were just extreme uh, weather events in uh, the fall and the winter of 26 and 27 um, in really from Kansas to Pittsburgh. And you have flooding from, uh, you have flooding in Cincinnati and Pittsburgh and Kansas in Illinois. Um, and as of March, the flood begins to move south of Cairo first in um, Missouri, and then flowing into Arkansas. April 21st was the greatest, the most cataclysmic breach of the flood, which occurred uh, right here in Mounds Landing, Mississippi. Uh, this was a breach three quarters of a mile wide and 100 feet tall. Um, and most of the deaths that occurred in the flood happened at this breach, and, and most of the deaths were African American men. And it's, it's interesting how difficult it is to count those deaths. Um, the suppositions is somewhere between the hundreds and a thousand, um, but, but nobody knows for sure. Um, so you see the waters flowing out over the Yazoo, Mississippi Delta and down through Arkansas. Um, now, New Orleans, which you can see right here, uh, was at the time a major banking center. There was a great deal of wealth concentrated in New Orleans at the time. So the powers that be in New Orleans did not want it flooded. And what they did to prevent that flood was to intentionally blow up a cravat, uh, sorry, a um, levee south of the city, uh, which happened on April 29th, um, and which flooded this area of Cajuns, uh, which were a French population of uh, fur trappers. And so it flooded uh, and sent all the, the Cajun refugees into New Orleans. Um, and it turned out that, that New Orleans would not have been flooded as it, as it turned out um, because what happened is as the waters began to flow south of Arkansas and into Louisiana, it created the, the flood created a new passageway to the Gulf and actually took a lot of pressure off of the Mississippi River. So you have Mississippi cotton country, Arkansas cotton country, and all the sugar country of this part of Louisiana all inundated um, from really from April through August. But um, uh, uh, laborers were not even back on, laborers were not back on their land and planting till the following spring um, of 1928. In all, the flood covered 27,000 square miles across seven states. Uh, there were almost 700,000 people made homeless, the vast majority of whom were African American. Um, cotton and sugar crops were destroyed for a whole season. There were 149 Red Cross, what were called in those days, or in, at this period, concentration camps. 
um, and these were guarded by the National Guard. Um, what became very controversial uh, uh, was not only that, uh, re that rescue efforts were in part um, differentiated by race. For example, in Greenville, uh, Mississippi, which is just south of this great uh, breach, um, uh, William Alexander Percy, who was the senator's son, um, evacuated all uh, white women and children but refused to evacuate any African Americans. And part of that was being influenced by planters who were afraid essentially to lose their labor. Um, and so, uh, so in rescue efforts there, was, there were Jim Crow conditions. Um, in relief efforts later on when uh, the money that had been donated to the Red Cross by the whole nation when these uh, relief goods were being distributed, there were allegations that seemed to be very true that the Red Cross allied themselves with the planters by giving them the relief supplies to then distribute to their sharecroppers. So, and often what happened is that um, planters would charge their tenants uh, for these supplies when they were actually given to them by the Red Cross. Um, so there were Jim Crow conditions both in rescue and um, relief distribution. And this very much came out at the, at the time. So I've just given you a very quick description of the event. What I want to talk about now for the next 15 minutes is how this became a story, how it became mediated um, through newspapers. Um, I'm not going to really touch that much on radio. Um, but as I've shown you, this event lasted for, for many months um, with storms beginning in August of 1926 and the flood really lasting till August of 1927, coupled with this duration was this remarkable new, new speed of communication technologies. Um, we have wireless technologies, telephones, which were relatively new, aerial reconnaissance, handheld photography, the linotype press. The nationwide radio circuit had just been established in February of 1927, so while this flood was happening, essentially. Um, the, Amer the AP and the American Negro Press were recently uh, constructed circuits, and these uh, not only transmitted um, words, but also photographs and cartoons and maps. So we have the technology, technologies in place to transmit this story of this flood far and wide quite quickly, um, and to bring about a lot of identification with, with people in the flood zone. This is a picture of the Red Cross camp at Vicksburg. Uh, which was actually cited on the Confederate uh, cemetery, interestingly. And I'll, I'll get back to that in a second, why that might be interesting. Um, all right, so what I want to talk about first, actually, I'll, I don't want you to look at that, so I'll, I'll <laughs> raise that for a second. What I want to talk about first is um, how different segments of the media covered the event. And so I want to begin with essentially the North, and how did the Northern press um, and, and the West, uh, including uh, uh, people on the West Coast, how did they understand this flood? How did they represent it? And I'm going to begin with Herbert Hoover, who was the Secretary of Commerce um, at this time, and he was not yet president. That would happen soon, soon hereafter. Um, and he made a point of borrowing the radio circuit three times during the flood to kind of transmit his message out to the general public. He was an engineer by training and ha had actually been the person to set up the radio circuit itself. So he's a really interesting sort of messenger of this disaster. Um, so he, one of his statements uh, was that we of the North have the right and duty to bind their wounds, meaning Southerners, to help this great army of unfortunate people. Now, you can probably hear an echo there. <laughs> Uh, so this phrase, uh, a right and duty to bind their wounds, comes from Lincoln's second inaugural address. Um, and imagining uh, victims in the, in the lower Mississippi Valley as an army of unfortunate people, clearly the Civil War is coming back in um, Hoover's mind. And he, and as I'm about to show you, a number of uh, really the general public in the North and West imagined this flood as an opportunity to do the Civil War over but the North would not be the destroyers of Southern splendor. They would be the rescuers of the South. Um, and so they saw sort of their munificence and their coming to the rescue 
of the South as a chance, in a way, to sort of bury those, uh, you know, to, to, to bind really their own, their own guilt, if you will. Um, New York Times on May 4th, there are two great battlefronts. In one, an army of rescuers is laboring to bring to safety the thousands marooned. And again, the New York Times, Hoover will see that the reconstruction machinery is well oiled. So just even the language of reconstruction is all over, uh, and particularly machinery um, brings up the idea of sort of an industrial north, a uh, rational industrial north coming to manage this debilitated, um, you know, really sort of still primitive south. Now I want to take us uh, over to Hollywood, um, and one of the features of the, the flood that I've found the most interesting, and I didn't expect to find it at all when I started looking at the archives, was that in order to raise money for the Red Cross, there were theater benefits all over the country. Um, and so there's a really extensive archive of theater events that let us see what the rest of the nation thought about the South, the South at this time. How did they put the South on stage to essentially make a public give money to, 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 to relieve the South? So it's a very interesting moment in theater history, too. Um, so this records uh, the scene of a monster flood benefit in Hollywood. And you see up here Hollywood luminaries at the time. I think this is Barrymore. Um, and below, there are scenes of refugees. Um, and they're all white refugees, I should point out, um, in the Red Cross camps um, and uh, children who are refugees. But the thing you would not expect to see on this page, I would gather, it would be this comic strip. And what it is, is the history of the Civil War, the, or the, the sort of the final battles of the Civil War leading up to uh, the South surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. Um, and you see the events both from the sides of Southern soldiers and Northern soldiers leading inevitably to reconciliation. So clearly, the Civil War was on the minds of many people during this event. Here was another, uh, it says, unusual array of talent and two big flood benefits over the weekend. And uh, this is sort of a snapshot of Hollywood in 1927. But one act that got top billing that I find particularly interesting is that of the Duncan sisters. I don't know if anyone in the audience knows the Duncan sisters, or knows, has heard of them. Um, but they had a, a vaudeville act that was popular for about 50 years, and they always did this routine, which was the Topsy and Eva routine from Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, this is, and one of the sisters, Rosetta, uh, would dress up in blackface, and she would be Topsy to her sister Vivian's e um, Eva. So why I find this interesting is that basically in order to get people to give to the South, to support the South, these images of sort of plantation happiness, um, plantation jollity and frolic were communicated to make uh, you know, others um, want to help the South. So this is an image uh, that was produced, again, in another northern paper, the Columbus, Dis Columbus Ohio Dispatch. And it was an image of the Red Cross uh, coming to the rescue of what they called the distressed Southland. Um, and uh, there's obviously Christic imagery here, the red, you know, the sign of the cross, which signifies the red cross, but also sort of Christ uh, moving over, Christ or, or really God moving over the waters. Um, but the South, you see, has no father. There's no patriarch here. Um, and it's a, it's, a white, uh, it's a white family without a father, in a way being welcomed back in to the national family. And, and you can see that uh, peop that the public in the North and the West were represent, or I should say the media in the North and the West were representing the flood event as an attempt to kind of repair family damages, national family damages um, still lasting from the Civil War. Well, needless to say the South, and particularly the White South, did not experience the event this way. Um, and they didn't particularly appreciate this way of representing themselves. Um, they called the flood coming down on them Yankee water. Um, <laughs> and as the Gulf Coast Guide put it uh, in June, we then wonder just whose water this is that comes pouring down upon us from the sheds of 30 states. Um, 
a Louisiana planter quoted in the National Geographic said, up north of us they build levees that turn lots of marshes into farms, but when high water comes, this system often turns a lot of our farms into marshes. And we have a lot of cartoons which are really interesting throughout the southern newspapers. Um, this is an image in the Memphis Commercial Appeal um, of uh, national drainage. So this is essentially the water being drained from those 30 states just pouring down upon the heads of southerners. And I think you see here a kind of Civil War era figure with his top hat uh, knocked off uh, and just trying to help himself with, uh, without federal help for flood control. Another image of the then President Coolidge <coughs> who is giving to the crippled South just one flower <laughs> and official sympathy, but that's all. Another from the commercial appeal is Calvin Coolidge who's called an engineering politician uh, who's measuring the national sentiment for adequate flood control. And what I find particularly interesting about this image is that the flood actually seems to be coming out of the nation's capital. <laughs> um, and that's politically how they understood it, that uh, because uh, the levee system was in part funded by the states at this point, there was no federal plan for flood management. Um, there would become one after this flood. Um, but so this was the southern sense that it was federal neglect. Um, which is interesting since the South was all about states' rights, but this is a case of federal neglect of the South. Um, one last image that satirizes the North. Uh, this is the think Uncle Sam as the thinker and the problem. Rodin's sculpture was well known by this point. It had been exhibited in the late 1890s. Um, but clearly Uncle Sam is not doing a lot of, oops, sorry, is not doing a lot of good uh, as he squats upon a Southern house. So this, in a way, is, is critiquing or making fun, of, uh, making fun of northern rationalism and northern science um, and how uh, unhelpful this thinker is at the time of this flood. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this event is that the critique of watershed management was not only a southern critique. It was shared by environmentalists around the country. Here you have Gifford Pinchot, the first chief of the U.S. Forest Service, who's calling the levees only management plan the most colossal blunder in civilized history. And you have a cartoon that shows this from the New York Tribune. These, these monsters or giants pouring water down uh, the lower Mississippi are called blind deforestation, drainage of lakes and marshes. You have denuded forest areas and then uh, people just having to throw money, essentially, at the problem of the lower Mississippi Valley. Now I wanna talk about the public discussion around uh, the so what, what, what African American pundits called an American scandal. Um, and so how was this, how was in a way the, the social disaster that was this flood covered? Um, you have a, Representative William Nelson, who was a, uh, a white Democrat from Missouri, declared that in the saving of human life, in great humanitarian undertakings, we know no color line. And many people tried to communicate that message that in the worst of times, the worst of times brings out the best of people, um, that essentially everyone will be equally taken care of uh, in the flood. Um, I'm gonna show you one circular that was uh, disseminated by the man who was in charge of the uh, Greenville uh, concentration camp, um, William Percy. And this was something which was posted in Greenville. He decreed that all Negroes in Greenville outside of the levee camp who are able to work should work. If work is offered them and they refuse to work, they should be arrested as vagrants. Um, and Greenville, as many historians have noted, was the wor really one of the worst cities, one of the worst uh, areas of um, Jim Crow discrimination during the flood. Uh, but this actually, I found this in the Chicago Defender. Um, so it was published uh, outside the flood zone um, by the black press in particular. Um, a number of African American journalists and pundits uh, had something to say about the flood. Ida B. Wells, who you may know from 
um, uh, her anti-lynching campaign uh, was really the most vitriol, not, that's the wrong word, but the strongest, the boldest um, uh, public African-American figure on the flood. And she basically said um, to African-Americans who were donating to the Red Cross, don't give any money unless reforms occur. You have to tie the money to awareness of the problems. But um, as I'll show you, W.E. Du Bois uh, got in on the, um, the, the, what was being handled, how the flood was being handled. I'll just let you read this. So what Du Bois is referring to is that during the, um, the flood in May, um, there were a number of incidents uh, in the flood zone, in the concentration camps. Um, uh, the National Guard shot one gentleman named Marshall Dunbar in Mississippi. Uh, there were two African-American men who were lynched in Mississippi um, and one man in Arkansas who was um, mauled and burned. Uh, which I should say that the white press in Arkansas publicly, de you know, um, decried, um, did not support. Um, but that's what he's referring to here. And this is in the NAACP's magazine, The Crisis, um, under this image of the uh, of a rescue barge. Um, they've put the words, "The Slave Ship, 1927." So Du Bois was a major voice in a kind of reckoning with this event. Um, one other thing that occurred in the African American community is that um, some ministers got out early on and, and declared that the flood was uh, God's, uh, God's sign um, or God's means of punishing the white South. So for example, God has poured his irresistible waters over the fields of the South to punish the white people for their mistreatment of the Negro. Quickly responding was William Pickens, who also worked for the NAACP, who said in the New York Amsterdam News, it is just as degrading a superstition to think that nature's perils are caused by somebody's sins as to think that storms and crop failures were caused by witches. Certainly if God meant to hit white people of the South by this flood, he made a wide miss on one of his biggest throws. <laughs> so he's saying, look who's suffering in this flood. This is not, you know, um, and he basically says, it looks, if there's a, f a race that is favored by God, it's not, it's not us, um, is, which is his, his, okay, wait, no, I didn't want to show you him too soon. Okay, so um, that's just a very quick sketch of kind of the journalistic conversation and representation of the floods in the African American press, in the white Southern press, in the white Northern and Western press. Um, and I, I think what interested me about it was just these, these different representations of the same event. Now, it's only part of uh, the book that I'm currently writing, and what came to interest me as I was looking through the archives was how the flood was taken up across these different media platforms. Now, as I mentioned, uh, money had to be raised for the Red Cross, and the way it happened was through these theatrical events. So you had major vaudeville figures like Will Rogers, who in the course of my research, I came to completely love this man. He was, he's just an amazing American figure. Um, he self-identified as a Cherokee, uh, I mean, and was a quarter Cherokee, grew up in the Oklahoma Territory, became the most important fundraiser for the f in, the f in the flood of 1927, and really made a very interesting environmental critique on behalf of the South. Um, and so he, he's, he is a very interesting figure, who I, and I don't have time, I'm just gonna quickly go through Another very important vaudeville duo, um, Rep Miller and Lyles, Flournoy Miller and Aubrey Lyles, um, were also major fundraisers uh, during the flood um, and were involved in a Broadway play about the flood which, which uh, took place in 1929. Um, these men were from Tennessee, were from very near the flood zone um, and how they represented particularly the African American predicament uh, sort of at the, at the wrong end of uh, modern science is really interesting. Um, this is that Broadway play, which if we had more time, I would play you the song. Maybe we can in the Q&A. Um, it was called Great Day, a musical play of the Southland. But it's essentially a very nostalgic rendition of the Southland. <laughs> 
Um, and then what, what really got me into this project in the first place was seeing the floods residue, if you will, in great works of literature. Um, now, I don't know if it, how many of you have read The Sound and the Fury. You probably don't think it's necessarily about a flood. <laughs> But it turns out there are flood references all over the novel. Um, William Faulkner began to write it in winter, the winter of 1928, um, really before even another crop was in the ground after uh, this flood. And what I think is if you were a New Orleans writer living in 2006, you couldn't write a novel that didn't have something to do with Katrina. And I wanna argue the same thing is true of William Faulkner writing in 1928. So that when you begin to look at Faulkner's work, you begin to see floods everywhere. Um, so it's there in Sound and the Fury, and if you remember, there's a scene at the end of the novel which takes place in an African-American church, and there are lots of figural descriptions of water rising, and I take it quite literally to me, I mean, that he's imagining the African-American community that was made susceptible during this flood of 1927. Um, as they lay dying, if you remember this novel, there is, a fl there is an actual flood in the middle <laughs> of it, and it's called The Greatest Flood of the Generation. He doesn't call it the flood of 1927, <coughs> but he wrote this in 1929. Um, and I think it's very much this whole novel um, a way of measuring how various groups in the, in the white South, um, in particular, were dealing with uh, this particular environmental trauma. Um, Richard Wright, who, was, who grew up in Mississippi and Arkansas and was living in Memphis during the time of the flood, who read all the newspapers that were uh, publishing things during the flood, um, and who left for Chicago uh, in the winter after the flood and spent the 1930s here in this city writing these stories that went into Uncle Tom's Children that was published in 1938. One of the novellas, one of the very long short stories in this is called down by the riverside, and it's about an African-American man caught in, um, in the flood, and he wrote another story called Silt that he published in 1937. Finally, William Faulkner's novel, The Wild Palms, which people don't read as often, but is very explicitly about the flood of 1927. Um, so one of the things that has come to interest me is that many people who talk about um, European modernism go to World War I to think about what was it that, that sort of brought about all the disorientation and, and alienation that comes out in great works of modernist literature. I would argue that for Southern modernism, and by extension for American modernism, it was this, this flood event was a major kind of foundational ground for um, our, our modernism. Now, in the, we have about 20 minutes left, and I'll try to only take up 10 of those minutes, but I wanna, if, if we were to take a course together, um, or if I were to, to lead you in a course, we'd get to read all of those works, but I can't really do that today, so I wanted to play you one song, um, because it's, it's almost like a poem, which Bessie Smith has sung, and just get you to hear a little bit more of uh, an actual text produced during the flood, um, and we can maybe talk about it more during the Q&A. So one of the reasons I think her song is so interesting, well, I'll tell you in one second. So Bessie Smith, she was known in this period of the late 20s as the Empress of the Blues. Um, she had grown up in Chattanooga, Tennessee in a low-lying low ground called Blue Goose Hollow, which was very flood prone. So she uh, understood flooding from her early age. Um, but in 1926, she was on a tour um, and she was, su she was such a celebrity and, and so, um, uh, so successful that she owned her own railroad car and this could couple on to other railroads. And so she, start, she was in Alabama when the, when the flooding uh, in the upper parts of the watershed, essentially in the Ohio Valley, um, began. She then moved to Nashville where she was caught for 10 days in the flooding that afflicted that city. Uh, 100,000, uh, sorry, just wanna make sure I got that number right. Um, sorry, 10,000 mostly African-American people were um, made refugees in Nashville. And while she was there, according to her sister-in-law uh, and other refugees who were with her said, Bessie, can you sing Backwater Blues? And she had never heard of that song, she didn't know it, 
Um, but it got her thinking, and as her train traveled up to St. Louis where she performed, um, and to uh, Louisville, to Chicago, to Detroit, to Columbus, Ohio, Cincinnati and Pittsburgh, which were both flooded, she got to see a lot of flooded ground, essentially. And when she arrived in Philadelphia to her row house there, she composed the song Backwater Blues. Um, she went up to New York City, and this was her accompanist, James P. Johnson, on piano. This was how her song Backwater Blues was promoted. Um, she was very much an empress, you know, very, very wealthy woman, so uh, th that image that showed her as a member of the folk wasn't, wasn't uh, accurate, but... Um, so I want to play you the song, and what I'd love you to listen for um, is how she, in a very short space of time, uh, manages to tell a story. Um, but that she's not only using the first person, only, not only using first person narration, she's not just telling one character's story. She moves really interestingly from a third person narrator, kind of setting up the scene, to, a f to an individual who's actually a, a refugee. Um, the other thing I want you to note is what the piano's doing. So uh, as those of you who are blues fans know, the voice and the piano, or whatever the accompanying instrument is, exists in a kind of call and response in a kind of conversation with each other. And what I think the piano does in this song is it acts almost like a weather machine. It can make, it can kind of simulate the sound of rain or of storms. And so it's showing how the environment can affect an individual, that individual singing. And it shows how it can kind of get under her skin. Um, so that by the end, when she's describing how she's feeling, the piano is making that same weather sound. So it's showing how the outer weather of the atmosphere becomes and comes, sort of takes over her inner weather, if you will. All right, so I will play you the song. When it rains five days in the sky, 
So 75 other blues songs were made after this, this song. Um, but one of the things I think is really interesting about it is that, so she experienced the flood in its early stages in February. She had time to cross uh, the tributary rivers, go to Philadelphia, compose the song, get up to New York, record the song on wax, and it was distributed as far as the Lower Mississippi Valley, even before floodwaters reached the Lower Mississippi Valley. So that's how quick media uh, technologies were that even for people who experienced the flood in Mississippi or Arkansas or Louisiana, they, they had already been taught in a, in a virtual way how to think about the flood and how to, how to consume it in a sense. Um, so I'm just gonna end with one thought. Um, scholars who study disaster have noted both the cultural tendency to treat these traumatic events as merely opportunities for shallow charitainment sprees or quick communal hunts for an individual culprit. But they've also noted that disasters, because they occur as a result of deep-seated social and scientific problems, can offer opportunities for addressing those problems. They can do so in particular by calling forth what people call a disaster citizenship, where non-elite victims can act as the, quote, primary definers of the story of blame and accountability as they direct criticism at power holders in society, end quote. In other words, disasters can allow new kinds of vernacular experts to speak and hence reorient the public understanding of social problems and faulty so scientific designs. So that's one of my big questions as I'm writing this book is, did that happen? You know, kind of what, what happened? Was there mere charitainment? Um, or did this event, because it, it let problems that people had wanted not to think about, it forced them into the open, did it bring out new kinds of witnesses, new people who could kind of tell the American story uh, in a new way? So thank you very much. Um, I guess we have time for Q&A a little bit. What was the uh, aftermath in terms of dealing with the, the flooding issue, with the four-story levees and the river ru uh, running above? That's a uh, great question. So e even before the, I think it was in June of 1927, there was a major convention that was held in Chicago. Uh, actually, the mayor of Chicago was very interested. Big Bill Thompson um, w convened this big convention, and they had Gifford Pinchot was there and a number of um, environmental planners. And there, the federal government did take over management of the, um, of the Mississippi watershed system and of the levee system. And another thing that I think is really interesting is that they got rid of the levees only policy and they decided to do what we might call today biomimicry, which is to manage it by uh, doing what the river itself would do. So creating these storage zones throughout the watershed, catchment devices, outlets. Um, they realized that rivers don't want to turn into drains, um, that rivers are always kind of trying to move against their walls. And so um, now there are actually two outlets, um, like the, the Atchafalaya River is another outlet um, of the Mississippi in Louisiana. So uh, interestingly, they, they learned a lesson that humans can't just dominate a river system, but they, have, they, they learned to mimic nature's own way of storing water um, throughout a river system. Um, I mean, you could argue that, well, one, one thing that's kind of interesting is that a book has come out recently uh, called shock, The Shock Doctrine. I don't know if any of you have read this book, but it argues that um, in the wake of major disasters, there's been a tendency of late to turn public uh, things that are handled by public money to privatize them. Um, and, and interestingly, the opposite happened in this flood where the public, the uh, federal government took over management of the Mississippi River system. Um, I mean, you could say they did it to protect uh, large farming interests throughout the valley um, so that the public essentially paid for industrial farming to be safe. But nevertheless, it was pub became a public uh, publicly supported. Has the Katrina disaster um, provided greater reminders 
1927, or is it, on the other hand, pushed it back and replaced it? So from, from a cult cultural perspective and for you as historians. That, that's a really good question. Um, I gather there's a great book that was written about this flood um, by a man named John Barry, who's a, who won prizes for his book about the flood. And it was in New Orleans, it was like the book of the month right before uh, Hurricane Katrina. Um, so it, it's, ve it's very interesting that people in New Orleans were reading about the flood of 1927. Um, and, and I'm calling it, I want to call it intentionally the New Orleans levee disaster of 2005 because I think by calling it Katrina, we sometimes think it was this monster that came at, you know, this female monster who came at the city and it was really a human mistake, human errors. Um, but I th for me personally, it was teaching a course in the American novel in the fall after the New Orleans levee disaster that made me do this project. So it actually made me want to go back and figure out, was this a new, you know, with what happened in 2005 new, or was there a longer history of, um, of in a way you could call it Jim Crow flooding. Um, and people's reaction to my presentations has been of increased interest because of Katrina, I would say. Um, so I think people are interested in the long-term history of, well, what people are now calling, I don't know if you all are familiar with this term. Have any of you heard this term, the Anthropocene? Um, so it's a new way of thinking about the period since from 1800 forward as a kind of geological period where the human alteration of natural systems has become so extensive that it actually amounts to another geological period in the Earth's history. Um, so people, have begun to think of disasters not merely as products of the 21st century, and we've had quite a string of them in the last few years, but looking back to circa 1800 and the Industrial Revolution um, to see how, to see a longer history of man-made disasters, essentially. With Katrina, we kept hearing about the Army Corps of Engineers did the Army Corps of Engineers exist in 1927, and did they play any role? They did exist. They existed in the 19th century, and it was actually their idea. The, levy, the levy's only policy was the Army Corps of Engineers plan. So, um, but they learned, I, I mean, they, they were willing to change strategy uh, after the flood of 1927, and as I said, sort of learn about biomimicry, you know, to, to work with the river rather than to try to just uh, merely dominate it. Um, but I think what's interesting is that engineering was very much um, uh, made questionable by this event. Um, and so what you see in a lot of representations from Hoover and from the Red Cross is to represent the rescue efforts as this ama amazing display of modern technology. Um, to kind of like sh sh you know distract attention away essentially from the human blunder that was that was the disaster, um, and often in, in in the cartoons you also have uh, there's an interesting cartoon that really went around a lot of the newspapers of a group of African American men in Park in Arkansas who tried to build their own uh, floating craft to um, rescue themselves, and this became a kind of blackface cartoon that was shown in the Los Angeles Times and another of a, no, a number of newspapers, and I read that as a way of saying, making fun of someone else's engineering blunder when there's a massive engineering blunder that's caused the whole catastrophe. Um, so there wasn't a lot of, uh, there, there, was an, there was an attempt to sort of def deflect attention away from the engineering disaster that this was. Knowing what happened, um, after Katrina and the, uh, all the people in the arenas there, what happened to the people in the concentration camps uh, after the 1927 flood? So, um, I mean, the reason that it became call, called an American scandal was that, uh, again, it was in the planters' interest to keep all their laborers there. So these camps essentially became guarded camps. Um, and there was an interesting deployment of Hoover appointed a group of African Americans to actually inspect the camps to see if to see what 
the distribution of relief was like and whether it was fair. And they wrote a report critical of some of the camps and supportive of some, and it, it, it was quite uneven. And actually some of the worst figures were, were Northerners who had come down who were running certain camps and who were very unsympathetic, particularly to African American uh, refugees. So it wasn't just a Southern problem. Um, but uh, where was I going with that? Um, <laughs> um, oh, but so this report uh, um, was threatened to be released, essentially, and Hoover managed to make to keep it quiet by promising the African-American people who, uh, it was uh, Moton who was head of Tuskegee at the time, um, uh, that he was planning a major property redistribution uh, in the Delta, which is pretty remarkable. Um, he, was, he was actually imagining uh, redistributions of property so that it, would, it wouldn't be in large blocks of, of plantations, but would be small land ownership throughout the Delta. But then he, uh, started his lead up for the presidential campaign in 1928 and that idea went away. Um, the camps lasted some of the, I mean people, uh, planters wanted their workers to get back to their plantations as soon as possible and there were a lot of com complaints about planters making their tenants go back to their property much too early, you know, when, when, when the properties were utterly waterlogged and, and unsuited uh, for habitation. Um, but they were definitely all in place through August, some of them through the fall, some of them even into the winter. Um, so these, these camps were in place for a very, very long time. And there was a um, certain amount of discrimination between the white refugees and the black refugees in terms of the kind of food, the freedom of movement, the amount of labor that was asked of the refugees. Um, and that's, that we know, that is uh, sort of documented for that, that some form of discrimination happened in every camp, and some were worse than others. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but thank you.